Well, we're here with Dick Hammond, Sidey Hammond, a veteran of 40 Sydney Hobart races, the first man to reach 40 Sydney Hobart races. Dick, um, your earliest memories of the CYC? The earliest memories of the CYC, uh, it was when the spook, Merv Davey, was running the place and uh, it looked like one of those worn out boat sheds with a sort of an attic thing up on the top of it and uh, we used to spend a lot of time up, up there after races talking. There'd be Max Crawford and Glaxo and um, Pam and I don't remember Glaxo's girl, but they, they were great days. And we used to drink Nikolai guys, brandy, sugar and lemon and shake them down and, and uh, all get pissed. and. Uh, forget to go home and look after the family <laughs> on the Sunday. Anyway, <laughs> that's how it was then. You mentioned um, Trigg and Magnus, yeah. the Hamilton brothers, mm. who have had amazing success yeah. in the Sydney Hobart race. Um, why were they so good and, and, and their designs? They designed their own boats as well. I mean, they designed yeah. Freya that won three in a row at the right. Sydney Hobart races. Tell us a bit about them and why well, they were so successful. They had good boats and they were very, very good seamen and uh, they're, they're very, they were very clever people at sailing that, and they, they stuck to the basics and the basics of anything are usually the way you've got to go anyway. You can see it in the football and that every day. And, um, and common, you know, common sense. And uh, uh, they didn't sort of hang around the pubs or anything like that and, you know, talk to other people. And that. They did what they thought, you know, was right. And um, that day, the one of the, their second second win, we, we, we'd, uh, Slady had built Dan Zoon too, and we thought we were always going to, you know, knock the Halversons off. But, uh, they, um, they just uh, thought things out a bit better than we did. And, and I think we were, we, we, when I, you know, when I was younger and that, you were always watching what the other person was doing and you could get sucked into, you know, doing something that really wasn't the right thing. But you, you went along with it and every now and then, and then you'd jag one, but they didn't jag them. They just sort of really concentrated on on the basics of sailing and you know when you're going south they had a lot of speed as far south as you, you know south as you can go and you don't get caught in on the you know on the, in on the, on the shore and the wind's out at sea and uh, well, you know they'd go out and look for it and uh, that one race we were the start of a Hobart race the second time that they won um, we were all locked together down uh, just uh, near the Shoalhaven and uh, we were all, all out of wind and our boat, we nicknamed it, that got used to get the Alan Payne thumps and the back the stern of it, you know, so get it out of the way. Jan two. Jan two, yeah, yeah. And uh, nobody's going anywhere and the next thing, the Halversons are going out to sea. Everybody was calling it a losing leg but it really was going to sea. And I got out there, went out for a couple of hours, and then I got into a lot of breeze out there, and away they went. And the next sked came up in the morning, and we're still floating around down near Point Perpendicular, and they're uh, 20 miles ahead, or 20 more miles ahead. And that sort of thing, uh, you know. You, but they were able to do it time after time, and, and uh, Stan was, um, he had some pretty, strong principles about what's the right thing to do and he was like the navigator that knew his stuff and he'd been trained properly uh, and he'd, uh, he'd had to use his navigation to save himself during the war and, and uh, he was just such a nice bloke and uh, Trig, well, uh, and they used to do things like this. We were in Jan June 2 again one day and we're coming down in, in the middle of Bass Strait and we're running down and they're in Norla. And so we look ahead and there's 
there they are, they're all sitting in the cockpit. They've got a reef in the mainsail and there's no wind and uh, got their um, waterproofs on and, and they're sitting there. Look, look at these silly bastards. Christ. Look at them. But we ran right down to them and then the next thing, a, a, a howling Wesley came in and we've got a spinnaker on which we couldn't get down and we're going east. Like, and it's blowing 60, it's like 60 knots. <laughs> and they, they do things, they're doing things like that, you know. And, and they, they thought it out. And I, I did a lot of work for Trig, uh, uh, you know, in his boat building, in their boat building business, he and Trevor. And um, yeah, he was a good, a good thinker. They. They also design very good boats. Oh they? yeah, yeah, the design and reliable. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that uh, Freya. Uh, well, that was a good one, but they, they were all pretty. You know, they're all pretty good. And uh, well, you mentioned Stan Darling, and um, along with Stan and uh, Bill Fesk, you're an integral part of Australia's first success in the Admiral's Cup, 1967. Yeah. In the challenge out of the CYC, yeah. uh, you were navigating Mercedes three, and along yeah. with Caprice of Hewitt and Belandra, you you won. Yeah. And that was the only second attempt for, from Australia to win the Admirals Cup. What do you put that success down to? I mean, we were we were a young team going over there with three very good boats, but um, you know the British knew their waters very different waters over there. What what do you put that success down to? Well. Um it was really preparation of knowing how to sail there, and uh, both Stan and and uh, and Bill had sailed there and quite successfully. I mean, uh, Caprice, uh, you know, won three of the out of their four bloody races, and uh, so in a lot 60, of those in 1965. In 1965, yeah, yeah, and a lot of those. Uh, um, uh, races, you know, were in those short races were in the Solon, and uh, uh, and looking back, you, you had unless you knew how to do it, you you wouldn't be able to sail well there. And um, I was a bit overawed. Although we went, we did that. They took me under their wing, and we had did a lot of meetings here in Australia uh, before we went, and. Uh, they sort of ran through what you had to do, et cetera, et cetera. And um, for me, I thought, Christ, I, there's a load on my shoulders of trying to keep up with these two guys. <laughs> you know, like we don't compare with one another. You know, Stan's capturing Germans in the war and Fesky's doing something else. And I, I, I wasn't even in the National Service then, I think. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, I th I was determined to try and learn as much about what I was trying what I was trying to do, uh, and get as much as I could out of those two blokes. And then I also realised that um, uh, after we went there. Uh, the, the, they had this uh, tidal tank in the South Hampton University, and um, um, it, it, it was uh, an outstanding example of how bad the, the water was to be in, in, in the tides. And uh, so, like most of blokes, you would go in and have a look and, and, and amazed at it and throw little bits of stuff in the water. And, and, and they, we had only last about an hour. And I thought, well, uh, I reckon they're going to learn really nothing except it's tricky. So I decided that I would, I, that I could, I could see a way of measuring what what was happening in this tank, although the scale was, you know, quite. Quite, quite different. Um, I went back and I took uh, Gordon Dunn, one of our crew, and uh, I picked. Um, I, I got the 
the little bits of flotsam and that, and I threw it all around, and I found out where the worst, where the m most uh, back eddies were uh, in the tank, and they, and then I, I numbered them, one, you know, one to uh, no A to P or something, Q R, and then I right up to R, and then I plotted uh, the tide. Uh, for every every hour of the tide, and, and how I use things like very strong, strong, medium, soft, standing. You know, little words like that. I I couldn't <coughs> I couldn't put a figure on it, but I just had to do it a different way. And after I plotted all that, that took a, uh, maybe a couple of days to to uh, get it all together. I went back and. Um, uh, I was determined to try and find the best sailor in, in England that had sailed there a lot. So I looked at um, Bobby Lowen, um, oh, I just can't remember another, a couple of other names, of them. And, and in the end, um, Bobby appealed, appeared to me and I went sailing with him a couple of times. And, and he could go around the Solon without any charts. He, I mean, he knew what to do. He took me fishing. We went around and tested all the points that I would got out of the out of the tank uh, in reality, uh, and to make sure that the stuff I had on these cards was going to be right. So, having got all that, uh, we started to race with it, and it was amazing that that the British blokes. Um, they were reading a story by about Peter, Peter Nichols on the back of a, a green chart or something like that. But it didn't have the information that, that I had. And that stuff that I got then and, and, uh, and uh, built up by practice and, and uh, hints from uh, Bobby Lowen, um, we, we had... Uh, there was a big gain, uh, big gain in it, and I re recall sailing in a race against uh, uh, Prospector Whitby, and we'd been over on one shore, and uh, we had to go out in the middle to go around a buoy and then back down the sole. And well, we were leading Prospector Whitby, and uh, we go past the buoy and not down over there. And my cards told me that down over there was that the tidal flow and the back eddy starts at such and such a time, you know, and I look at the watch and um, the blokes on the boat, the gore get upset. Look at them, look at them, because they're going over there, we must be going the wrong way, we must be going the wrong way. Well, let's tack. I thought, well, tack and let them think that they've got us beaten. We go down here for a while and then when we get down to a, like a good point down there, we'll tack again and go back. And we were doing things like that. And uh, I'd also was able to go inside the Gurnard Ledge. And, and it, it goes on and on and on and on. So they give all this to, to Stan and Bill. Uh, I don't know that they actually work that way, but uh, they had them. And uh, we got, like uh, in Mercedes, we got uh, like a very good result. We won our division in the fastnet race, we won our division in the channel race. Uh, we, uh, so we had, and then we were third overall in both of those and third in another one. And then we got given a first in one other because of disqualification or something like that. And we were the best boat. Knocked the whole lot of them, lot of them off. Now, that all happened really by hard work. <laughs> it wasn't anything else. Forty Hobart races, the, the multitude of uh, fast net races and sailing in Hawaii. What was your worst experience at sea? I mean, the, the, let's start with the worst storm and then maybe an experience that wasn't in bad weather. What about the worst weather that you, you've been in? Well, it was in the first race I went in. And, first uh, Hobart race? First Hobart, 1952. And I, Peter Brown, I used to sail with Peter in, uh, in his skiff down at Manly, and uh, he'd got a, a ride in the Hobart race in Wanderer the year before 
I went and I asked him to get me on that, you know, get me on that boat. So I was sort of on there in my first Hobart race. And uh, I, it, I, I just, I can see it now, the, the whole thing. We get down near, down the south coast and uh, we get hit by a, with a 50 or 60 knot southerly and the boat's leaking like they all do. There's water going everywhere and the things are breaking and and uh, we're pumping and anyway we didn't sink and we came out of it okay. <laughs> and uh, then later on when we got down to Tasman Light, it was 80 knots down there and there was ice on the mast. Now nobody believes that but you've got to believe it, it was ice on the mast. And 80 knots is a fair bit of breeze, and their jib sheets were made of chain, not wire or rope, but they're great clanging chains. And so when you go about, I used to go up and try and help to get it, help to get around, and Peter would be on the pull the fucking thing <laughs> on the wheel, trying to get around around Tasman Light. And uh, he got worried about me because it's dark, we're at night, and uh, he can't see me. And you've got this lot of wind blowing and these crashing bloody chains. And, and we took a leg, leg out to sea and uh, we went about, we went out about five miles and then we came back and we were back exactly where we had started off. You also won the Admiral's Cup again in 79, uh, navigating Ragamuffin yeah. with Sid Fisher, and that was the year of the tragic Fastnet race. Yeah. How did that storm, the Fastnet race storm, compare to storms that you sailed in, in Sid, uh, out of Sydney in the Hobart race in Bass Strait, for example? Um, it was pretty rugged, but uh, we, we had done a couple of things which were I, I'm allowed to say this, was smart. And even though it, there was a lot of wind and, and some bad seas, we really didn't get them at the, on the wrong angle of, of uh, sailing. And then you look ahead and you see these bloody black clouds, like really dreadful looking clouds. The worst, they are the worst clouds I've ever seen. And we had a, uh, we were firstly reaching and then we put a, we had a shy spinnaker on. And I thought, Christ, if we try and carry this spinnaker right down the bottom and get too far down that way, uh, we're going to get into trouble trying to get to the rock. So I said, I'd take the spinnaker off and let's reach across this way on a, re on a proper reaching angle and then we'll put the spinnaker on again running down to the rock. We'll do it that way rather than spinnaker reach. We do the reach, spinnaker. So anyway, we, we, as we get down within five miles of the rock or something like that, the wind's blowing really, really hard and we're doing 13 knots with every bloke on the deck and it was really blowing but we were reaching and uh, there's a lot of difference between reaching and going into big seas Anyway, uh, we had to go down past the rock quite a bit so that when we tacked that we'd be able to get, get round and come back. And as we came back, Willie Wall came round on, just on the in, inside of us, so we'd, we'd done a lot. Well, from there on in, uh, the wind, um, the, the low was very close to the rock itself, and so as time went by, the wind just kept on swinging around. and. Uh, and we were reaching and we couldn't quite reach our course but it was obvious that we were going to be able to reach up later so we just speared off and we're running down these bloody waves and um, I suppose the biggest wave I've been on was on that on that run and um, uh, I had uh, uh, I, uh, I'd been talking I'd been talking to Sid about how the wind started to lighten off a bit. We haven't got enough sail on ship, we haven't got enough sail on it. Oh, you can shut up. You're the tactician or something. <laughs> it depends on what time it was. And uh, get on, you just get on with your navigating. 
So uh, about half an hour later, I had another go at him, and he um, and he, he said, yeah, "Look, I told you to get on with your, you know, again. We'll look after this." And then half an hour later, he came down. He'd been up there for umpteen hours, all the holding on to his men and every, you know, every, he was really, really like a py pyramid of bloody strength. And uh, I'd lie there in the bunk and I thought, will I say anything to him? I've already had two goes. Yeah, I, maybe I'll go and I said, we haven't got enough sail on the boat. We're not, we're not going properly. All right, well, you fucking will go up, up on deck and you change it and don't break anything. And I thought, oh. <laughs> so I had to get my coat on. <laughs> I started going up the stairs and I'm going like this, making a hell of a lot of, like, look, stamping in rage. Then anyway, I get up there and I get over and I grab hold of the wheel and I said, I'm in charge here now. And so I start steering the boat and I go on for a bit, change the gear, change all the gear in it. And, and uh, after a while, I got Mono standing alongside me, and we had nosedived in the in the silent in practice before this race. In the, we were tied against the against the wind, and the nose of the boat had gone into the wave, and it didn't come up. It just stayed there. The boat just sat like sat like it, and it still as it bugger, just slowly moving around like that until the main sort headed into the wind and it crashed across. So Mano's like, and I look down and I see, I see it, and I see it down there, it looks a lot of it, like about 60 foot down like that, and Mano's here, and you know that you've seen, you've been in a lift and, you, and you, your stomach falls away and everything like that, well <coughs> his was, he was doing the same thing. <laughs> anyway, we went down and the wave looked all right at the bottom and we just went went that out like that. And then the next the crew say, righto, sidey, piss off, we look after this now. So we went down and I, uh, again, we were in the right seaway when when all, when all this wind and that was flying. So I'd hate to be there down where all those other, they, all, those, all those other boats got into trouble. They were out on a wind to try and get up to the up to the right rock. Yeah. Um, some of your favourite boats. I mean, you've sailed on um, a myriad of boats. Well, what what was a couple of boats that really you know you had an affection for? Oh, Ginkgo was, yeah, yeah. It had everything really. It had a good crew. It had a funny bloke in Benny Lexon and kept us amused all the time and uh, the boat was good and I had free rain, free rain on, uh, on Ginkgo um, and I, uh, I, ha I had complete control of the, really control of the boat, not necessarily the, the, all the trimming of it but where it was going and what we were doing and what sort of sails we had on it. And, I was sitting down there on the boat one day and, I, and Benny Lexon was there and he said, he talked to the other guys there and he said, I don't know what, I don't know what he does, but while we're winning like this, I'll keep going where he tells me to go. <laughs> and they, they were, they were like that. They, they uh, were just great sailors and uh, uh, yeah, they were great. So that's, that's um, uh, Ginkgo. Uh, well, of course, Sovereign was something else. It was a um, yeah, terrific boat. It was built at the right time and the right size and everything. And, and there were some good, you know, good fellas on that. Um, how, do you, how do you see ocean racing today? You, you can go cover 50 years of ocean racing or more. How do you, how do you see it today? Do you, do you feel it's a, a safe sport, as safe as it was, or as safe as it can be today? Well, if you talk about safety, I, uh, 
there's a, a lot of rules that have you know, grown up over the years and that and they have tended to make them you know make everything safe but th th it has changed a hell of a lot really um, you know I think back about some of the times I had I remember the earlier days of my sailing oil and I do you know my ladder ladder years and uh, in, a, in a way uh, it seems to have gone it's been controlled by you know my money and sponsorship and things like that so we've got all these big boats now all sponsors all big and everything like that and uh, the the joys of ocean racing um, have slipped sideways a little bit I think in, in, in doing that I don't think that the I mean the blokes that sail on those big boats now probably don't know the difference between what they're on and what they used could have been on years ago and um, I don't know how they're going to be able to change it really I mean the, if you're going to run a club with sponsorship that's what you're going to end up getting and there's pl seem to be plenty of blokes that have got enough money to ha put it in no, that hasn't changed but as far as I'm concerned I haven't Bob Oatley's often asked me if I'd like to go out in his boat and some of the blokes said, oh, if you go on that thing, you'll get thrown off it, tipped off it. And uh, I haven't really, I, in my mind, I haven't really taken him up on it at all and that because I think I, what I did with the latter part of my sailing is I, want, I got off all those big boats and I went back and got on Maris with, uh, with Keenan. And he got six guys on the boat, running the boat, and, and uh, you know, it was as I used to know it when I first started. And, and it's a joy, uh, and for me, um, that's why I basically finished off. Well, thanks, Dick. It's been terrific speaking with you, and uh, thank you for your time.